Okay. Um, welcome back from lunch. This is always a challenging sl slot in a, any conference. Um, but I did just want to make a couple of quick announcements before we get to the next panel. And that is that um, after this panel concludes and the Q&A concludes at 3.30, we're going to go out that door and outside for our group photograph, OK? So at 3.30, just follow us going out to the back for a quick group photo. Then we'll come back in. We'll grab some coffee. And around 3.45, um, we'll, we're just going to do an informal screening of a, f a short film, an eight-minute film that grew out of some of the research of our keynote speaker, um, who will then be uh, starting her keynote promptly at four. Okay, so um, we got to get out and get a picture, get back in, get your coffee, um, take a qu quick look at the film, and then we'll get on with it after that. Um, it's this panel is called the Uptakes or Upstakes of new financial tools and technologies. We're trying to think about both um, the issues around uptake and adoption um, that we've been implicitly discussing and sometimes explicitly discussing throughout the conference so far, uh, uptake, but also we're really interested in the stakes of these things. Why does it matter? Um, what, what's the importance of, of it? What are the stakes um, in uptake of new financial tools and technologies? And I'm really thrilled um, <clears throat> that Sonia Arnaza could be here as our uh, moderator discussant. She's the Managing Director of Inclusive Innovations um, and also consults with the Better Than Cash Alliance um, with 18 years of experience in international development, digital financial ser services, entrepreneurial in investment, and financial inclusion. Um, I'm very, very glad that she could be here with us today. Thank you for coming. I'm just going to hand it over to her. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mill. Uh, and well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you are um, well caffeinated because I've realized that we're sitting in the middle of an after delicious lunch digestion on the uh, group photo. So let's try to like to make it till the end. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the ITMFI's uh, team for making this conference possible. Uh, for bringing together such a superb group and also for the opportunity of uh, participating on this conference. Um, and as Bill mentioned yesterday, uh, one of the key takeaways from this group is that it's giving attention to basically to voices from the field and it's supporting the ground level perspective. That is, this is giving financial inclusion a human and a social face. So kudos to all of you for that. Um, the work that ITMFI is leading is certainly relevant for the work that we at the Better Than Cash Alliance uh, do. Why? Uh, for some of you that may not know, the Better Than Cash Alliance is a partnership of governments, international organizations, and companies that um, support the shift from cash to digital payments. And in doing so, um, the Better Than Cash Alliance is based at the United Nations, and it has more than 50 members. And among those members, 19 countries are members of the <coughs> alliance. Um, we work in supporting the shift from cash to digital payments for an inclusive and uh, economic growth. And basically, we work on advocacy and outreach on knowledge and research, and also providing member services to uh, the partners of the alliance. As to mention some countries, for example, uh, we're working with uh, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Uruguay, India, Kenya, Bangladesh, Philippines, uh, Nigeria, Malawi, etc. And um, our panel today, this afternoon, as Bill mentioned, is on the upstakes of new financial tools and technology. That's another thing that they really like about the conference is this catchy names uh, for each session. So it's like, I think once we go home, it will be difficult to forget some of this nice and tricky and easy to remember name for the sessions. And so digital-based financial services, or DFS, 
have the potential to reach excluded and underserved populations and to assist countries in meeting ambitious financial uh, goals. This is because of the emergence of new technologies, the emergence of mobile phones, and the usage of these mobile phones in developing countries that has had an exponential growth in the last decade. We have seen with excitement these opportunities that new financial tools and technologies bring to the financial inclusion agenda, and as we have seen in, in these past days, to some extent, to the, the exclusion of people. And some of this um, initiative have been, uh, have allowed to bring social development and economic growth. However, given this abundance of initiative led by either the private sector, the government, or like a cooperation uh, between them, we haven't seen many, many, many successful stories as we could have liked to see. Why? Why are we still seeing some challenges in the adoption, the usage, and the uptake of these mobile technologies or this solution or this initiative? Many questions still remain related to these challenges and to these issues. Some of those questions are being tackled by you, by your excellent um, work. And for example, how to develop an inclusive digital ecosystem and consider within it its social dynamics and its social interactions. What is the interplay of the different stakeholders in the ecosystem? Are we talking about funders, private sector, the government, banks, telcos, regulators? What are their roles and responsibilities? What's their skin in the game? How to ensure a level playing field? We talked yesterday, there were some questions about the, the, the role that the regulator plays. So how to reach an equilibrium or a trade-off between the regulator and also the regulator providing an enabling environment, but at the same time, not a stiff in innovation. Also, is there a sequencing approach as to being successful? Can we have different Kenyas, Tanzanias, uh, Uganda's uh, experiences in the market? Like in Latin America, um, what's going on with um, Paraguay? what's going on in Guatemala, what's going on in India, et cetera. So is, is there a pattern? Could be like a sequencing on how to do this? How and when it makes sense in some cases to go beyond payments and lendings to savings to insurance or to other projects also known as like Digital Financial Services 2.0? Are traditional players being disintermediated? This is something that we, we discussed recently. What's the role of the, the FinTech? And in this confluence of the financial and the telco sector, what are we finding in the middle? Are we finding just FinTech? Or as we um, listened in the morning in the, in the previous presentations, what is the role that these intermediaries are playing? How to diversify the customer base? Is it a generational issue? It's amazing to me to like to find that my 14 old daughter is so excited about touching and seeing the lights of my iPhone. And also I compare that to how long it took me to make my parents use WhatsApp and have the ability to communicate with Peru. On the one side, it took my daughter like minutes as to be like, to be using the iPhone, and also it took me kind of like weeks to do that with my parents. So is it a generational issue? Um, how can we bring this particularly to women and rural consumers, and how to overcome lack of trust and loyalty? Finally, how to keep pace with technologies? We're talking about payments, insurance, digital finance, there is in the market blockchain, data lending, data or big data analytics, etc. 
In sum, finally, we can say that technology has allowed the broadening of the value chain for the provision of digital financial services through, though with this is bringing also some challenges and complexities to the uptake and the provision of responsible, inclusive digital financial services. With that in mind, and without the intention of making you feel overwhelmed at the end of the conference, I would like to uh, introduce the panel today uh, for, this, for this session. So we will be uh, talking again about the upstakes of new financial technologies and tools. And we will have, first of all, um, the separate self, interdependent self, and new financial technologies, lessons from rural southern India by Benkat Govindan from the French Institute of Pondicherry. Then we will have cross-border transfers as an strategic tool to promote the diffusion of mobile money in rural areas. The case of Burkina diaspora living in Ivory Coast by Solène Morvan Roux at the University of Geneva, Simon Barousseau, the University of Geneva, and Dieudonné Ilbudo of the National Center of Scientific and Technological Research in Ouagadougou. Last but not least, we will have exploring Rosca Dynamics with a Cambodian factory worker board game that many of you have enjoyed uh, during lunch by Andrew Crawford. Okay, with that, let me kick off with um, Benkat. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for IMFTI for funding this project. The project title is Separate Self, Interdependent Self and the New Technologies Lessons from Tamil Nadu located in rural southern India. This project is about how the various phases of money and finance have been affected by the financial inclusion program. In India, a massive effort has been made over the past decade to bank the unbanked citizen. This has involved channeling social benefits through bank accounts and using new technologies that allow transaction to be made in, in all the rural, rural populations. So the research objective is, it draws mainly field work done in rural southern India with the aim of answering the following questions. What are the effects on financial practices and mainly on saving, which is a key role of the financial inclusion programs? How do people use their bank accounts to save money? Is the culture of saving claimed by the program is taking place? Second. What have the effects been in terms of accounting practices? To what extent does the bankization change how people count and calculate? The third one is on about worldview. It is to highlight the discrepancy of worldviews and to propose to explore how local perceptions and rationals coincide and interact. The last question is about the effects of bankization and financial tools based on new technologies on social discriminations with a particular focus on Dalits, women, and unfree laborers. Methodology. The project methodology is to combine a household survey with a qualitative analysis. In terms of household survey, the project aims to compare two waves of surveys. The first was conducted in 2010 among 400 migrant laborers, and the second one will be conducted in August 2016. A large portion of the population in the study area are migrant laborers, usually from January to July. In, in 2006, a first financial inclusion program was launched by the Reserve Bank of India. The main objective was to provide a bank account for all the households with a particular focus on rural areas. Although the bank account penetration has improved from 35% in 2001 to 58% in 2011, account usage has remained rather low and roughly half of the accounts are inactive. In 2014, and in continuation with the earlier initiatives, started in 2005, 
a large scale of financial inclusion program was launched. In the region we studied, the program works as follows. For most social transfers like NDRIGA, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which is a massive employment program in India, people now don't have any other choices. They must have a bank account and the wage is deposit deposited in their bank account. The bank transfer is also an obligation for other programs like old age pension, disaster relief, school scholarships, LPG gas subsidy, and all the fertilizer subsidies. National banks have the obligation to open a bank account to every villager with a fringe balances. At the same time, relation with the banks and the villages are reduced to the minimum. When bank accounts are credited, a business correspondent called BC, who is a commercial intermediary between the banks and clients, acting on a commission basis, goes to each villages, delivers the deliver the cash. Each client has a smart card. The card is inserted in a small electronic machine, commonly called as a smart card machine, connected to a internet. The client must be then recognized through his digital print. Once recognized, the amount of his deposit appears on the screen and automatic voice announces the amount, total amount. The BC delivers the amount requested in cash with a receipt. Many dysfunctions remain. However, the villages' bank registration remains a very modest reality. Most of them, in the fact, have no contact at all with the banks, which remain a distant, unfamiliar world to them, and most clients immediately withdraw the payments. Banks are used to channel payments, but not to manage accounts. There are, there are recurrent problems involved in the delivery of cashes, which include fingerprint authentication works very poorly. To show this map. Kadu wang kadu kau nanti, mama yang kadu kau nanti, mama udah. Kita kau nanti, mama udah. Kita kau nanti, mama udah. Kita kau Orang orang panamnya baru ni orang ni, anda orang katu mana? Sebab anda orang kamp pinggir baru, rezeki sebab kamp, baru nak kamp, sebab ini pinggir yang macam apa? Pinggir ini sangat macam. Anda naik ni, kaya ni lah kaya tu orang. Kaya lah orang tu je, ni malah kaya tu orang ni lah. Betul dah dah kaya tu orang. Ah macam ni, dia. So finally she is successful in getting the authentication. The poor connections prevent Poor connections prevent the BCs accessing information and also delivering the caches. 
There is also often a machine failure. BCs regularly have to send them for maintenance. As there are few places where there is a maintenance can be done, this can sometimes results in a long delays. Insufficient cash to cover all the client's needs, needs BC can't get more than 2,000 Indian rupees advance from the bank and must present themselves in person at the bank to get the additional cashes. Insufficient battery charge is also a common problem. Information also inadequate or late. This is due to inadequate information transfers between the administration and the banks. In some cases, clients themselves are unclear as to what they are eligible for and complain. And other problem is absence of BC for health or personal reasons in which every client can go to the bank to get the due, but some banks refuse to deal directly with them and ask to wait for the response of the BC. The maximum withdrawal amount is also limited to 2,000 rupees. In the event of a higher amount, the clients have to deal directly with the bank. And it also leads to the, some cost conflicts. BC system also raises cost conflicts. Each BC has a several villages in charge without any distinction between the Dalit settlement, Dalits are ex-untouchables, and non-Dalit settlements. All BC are women from the villages, usually former self-help group members. When the BC is a Dalit community, non-Dalit are extremely reluctant to accept the payment from her. They won't express, express it implicitly, but will argue that she is not available, she does not know how to use the machine, she is not kind, or many reasons. And the next one is, what are the effects in terms of saving practices? Looking at the saving practices also confirm that banking sa bank saving is not an interest for them. A quantitative survey is still needed to confirm our qualitative findings, but it seems that bank deposit remain extremely limited and uncommon. People do save, but in different ways. There, is al there are also misunderstanding and rumors. The fact that bank accounts are directly connected to the social transfers, which lead to a number of misunderstandings. Many people told us that if I keep money there, they may think that I am rich. Many villages also mistrust the bank and refuse to leave even a single rupee for fear that they may not be able to get it back later. And the third one is about the public dimension. Public dimension of transaction is almost completely incompatible with the individual saving practices. Most villages are embedded with a complex web of financial transactions with their closed circles. The transaction between the BC and the clients usually takes place in a public. A dozen or more people gather around the BC, some to get the dues, others because they hope to get something from the BC, others out of curiosity or simply to pass the time. The details of who gets how much spreads readily throughout the entire village. Most transactions draw a number of comments also. There are also some kind of comparative advantages of local saving practices. Besides bank savings, exploring the local perception of savings, in Tamil it is semipu, which means how people protect themselves from their daily hazards and a plan for the future. And there are three common way of savings in the rural. One is gold, rose cast, which is, we call it as chit fund, and the third one is lending to others. This figure shows the relative importance of the three saving practices in our survey. All the household 100% own gold for an average amount of 92,000 rupees and their average annual household wage is around 80,000 rupees. Gold also represents 79 percentage of the total savings and it is a primary form of saving. Our survey also identified two types of rose cars or cheat funds, 40 percentage in action rose cars and 32 percentage in the lottery kind of rose cars. The third form of saving in the region is about the private money lending to others. Price and repayment modalities were greatly and depend on three main factors. How close the two parties are, how urgent the borrower's request, and what degree of liquidity and lender is looking for. And about the calculation, accounting and calculation. One of our research questions is to do with accounting and calculation. How far does the bankerization affect accounting and calculation process? For the moment, most people use their bank accounts only as an occasional channel to receive the social benefit. As a consequence, the issue of possible transformation of the accounting and calculation process does not arise. We thus focus on existing accounting and calculation process. According to our 2010 survey, informal lending, unregistered or unregulated, remains the most common source of borrowing. As far as return records are concerned, 
borrowers may have to sign a blank debt certificate that could be used in the event of a conflict. Its legal value is unclear, but it can be used with the customary authorities. Neither lenders nor borrowers keep a written records of the amount of the transaction. About the household savings, within the household, keeping accounts, for instance, listing income, expenses, keeping bills is very uncommon in the rural Tamil Nadu. The next one about the financial transactions. Ceremonies are the only events and the financial transactions for which families keep a precise accounts. The most common ceremonies include children's marriages. Yes. The children's marriages, girls' puberty, uh, birthday functions, housewarmings, and funerals. Amounts vary according to the social groups. For Dalit, nowadays, a typical amounts in the region studied range from about three to six lakhs rupees for the marriages, which means on an average four to eight years of household income, amounts have considerably risen, risen over the last decades. Usually families have one notebook for each event. It's shown in the photograph. With a list of givers, the names and the amount of the gift, which can be either in cash or kind, mostly gold, cloths, vessels, and food. Gifts are restricted only for the relatives. This example shows the housewarming function, which has 283 entries, which I given only 25 here. Only the organizers of the events who receive the gift on the day of the ceremony keep the accounts. The givers usually stick to mental accounting. This requires strong memory capacities, but these are often highly developed among the people with little written culture. Usually in each family, one person is in charge of the family memory, which may be traced for several generations. Women who are often in charge of this memory tell us that how they keep precise images of people, events, and locations. Whenever they meet someone from one particular family, the memory of, memory of the transaction comes up in their mind. Any discussion related to this particular family is also an opportunity to remember. When transactions have been a source of tension or conflict, it is often the case, as shall we see below, recalling it over and also helps to fix the memory. These events and the notebooks that go with them play a key role in the family calculations. For various reasons, first of all, these events are concrete opportunities to display and make visible, in Tamil it's called as Mariyade of the family. Mariyade is a re relational product, something people produce when they give and receive it. About the, about the calculation. We try to understand the kind of calculation that come into play from the giver's point of view. Amount in cash or weight in gold are systematically compared with how much were given previously and to what extent it should be given in the later stages. Previous gifts received by the receivers and the forthcoming events for each part, here there is a precise calculation how much shall I owe at the time of the ceremony and how much I need for the future events I have to organize. The social distance from the receiver with a specific criteria for each circle, relatives, friends, and colleagues. The social position of the giver compared to the receiver. Here, mostly criteria related to the class and the kinship come into the play. The quality of the relationship and the willingness to continue the relationships is also there. Then we have these two classifications that about the world views and the uh, separate self and interdependent self. We have the immobile money and versus circulation and the juggling money. And about the financial practices, the common is about bank account versus lending to others, rose cars and ceremonies. Calculation, financial calculation versus social and financial calculations. For at the end of the the conclusion is further work is required to get better understanding of the framework of the calculation that take place within these different settings ceremonies, financial transaction of daily life. At this stage of the research project, it seems that the contrast between the two should help to have a better understanding of how people understand, translate, and possibly manipulate the, ma the formal financial tools that are offered to them. In line with the research proposal, we plan in the second phase of the project to conduct a second 
round of household surveys, which will allow us to quantify the evolution over time of financial practices. We also plan to analyze the possible differentiation in terms of gender, class, and caste. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have um, Solène, Simon, and Yudoné with cross-border border transfers as a, a strategic tool to promote the diffusion, diffusion of mobile money in rural areas. some help, please. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Ah, okay, it's here. Okay, sorry. So, okay. okay, good afternoon. Um, so I'm, I have the easy part to introduce this presentation uh, of this co collective project on mobile money for international remittances uh, in West Africa, more precisely between Ivory Coast and uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, before starting, I would like to uh, make two warm uh, thanks. W the first one goes to the IMTFI team for its, um, your constant support and very enthusiastic uh, support all along this uh, first part of the, of the project. The second uh, thank, um, warm thank uh, goes to some uh, of the team members who are not here today, but who have been very uh, much involved in the data collection uh, part, uh, namely Stéphane Reuss and uh, Camille Compaoré, as well as Moro Savadogo. So many thanks to them, and uh, uh, we will uh, give them uh, some uh, feedback from the conference. Uh, so I will introduce the, the, the presentation, and then Simon uh, will follow, and uh, Dieudonné Boudot will not be presenting, but he is here to answer some questions uh, that may come out after the presentation. Um, so just as uh, pr presenting the outline of the, of the presentation, I will start with the background and main research qu question of the project, and then uh, Simon will present the methodology and the prelim preliminary findings. Uh, so, st starting for the, with the background, uh, what we uh, for, uh, for what we know from what we know, um, existing empirical evidence of mobile money diffusion and usage uh, focuses on uh, mainly fo focuses on, on domestic level, on specific uh, case studies, country case studies, uh, also on the demand side and on transfers uh, between rural and uh, urban uh, places. So the or originality of our, st our study lies in the fact that we look at uh, 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 mobile money for uh, international transfers uh, uh, between uh, two countries, between Ivory Coast and uh, Burkina Faso, uh, taking advantage of the introduction of uh, remittance services, mobile money remittance services in 2014, in 2014, Sorry, uh, between Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso. So the the, the context uh, in uh, we've been looking at uh, is characterized by long-standing migration dynamic. Uh, one very important aspect is also its uh, rural-to-rural uh, migration, which means that migrants go from their village to a uh, rural and agricultural uh, region in uh, Ivory Coast that will. Uh, we will present you uh, later on. Uh, there is a very strong uh, remittances flow between the two countries, namely going from uh, Ivory Coast and uh, to Burkina Faso, uh, 130 million uh, dollars in 2014. And the introduction as, and of mobile money for uh, these specific uh, transfers has been uh, strongly supported by the uh, Central Bank of West Africa. Uh, so we have been looking at the very sp specific context uh, characterized by adverse uh, 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 situation with regards to financial inclusion, both in Ivory Coast and in Burkina Faso. Uh, in, in both countries, uh, lack of roads, power, internet, ac internet access, and also a very strong uh, uh, security issue. 
and uh, at the same time a high uh, penetration of uh, mobile money, mobile phone. Sorry. Uh, so the research question we've been uh, uh, we started with, uh, where um, the first one was broadly uh, speaking, uh, identifying the patterns of usage and the factors that are instrumental uh, in the uptake of mobile money for uh, international uh, remittances. Uh, uh, so in some more specific uh, question we've been looking at uh, is to look at the provision of uh, the mobile money services compared to other services and we put a strong emphasis on the supply side also looking at the migrants' characteristic uh, through a survey uh, at uh, individual level, household level, uh, and looking at age, gender, location, and mobility as some uh, explaining factors of uh, the uptake of mobile money for um, remittances. And also we looked at the broader uh, socio-economic and social-political context uh, this population have to deal with and uh, that uh, also give more uh, importance to uh, uh, maintain the uh, ties with their own country through uh, these uh, remittances. The first, so second set of uh, questions we've been asking is, is uh, mobile money, the use of mobile money to uh, remit, um, uh, inducing and reshaping remittances uh, characteristic uh, usage and uh, channels? So we've been looking at amounts, frequency, and the beneficiaries as well, uh, looking at a, a potential disruptive uh, effect. Uh, also, we've been looking at the usage of money cents and the emergence of new brokerage dynamics. So a lot of questions and you will see that we are done with the fieldwork uh, already and we still have a lot of to analyze, but Simon is, will be uh, presenting the primary uh, finding of these projects. Thank you, Selene, for uh, your short uh, introduction. So uh, I will uh, talk about the methodology that we conduct during uh, our field work. First one is uh, multi-seat data collection. So it's difficult to, to study migration uh, without taking care about the departure zone, but also the destination zone. So we uh, first conduct our, our survey in uh, Ivory Coast during the months of uh, October and November. And after, we conduct the survey in uh, January and February in Burkina Faso. Second aspect is to have a broader view of uh, mobile money diffusion, to take in, into account the supply and the demand side of mobile money. And the third uh, aspect uh, of the methodology is a mixed method with different kind of uh, data collection tools. Uh, we take into account the spatial dimension of uh, mobile money and also qualitative and quantitative tools. How do we select the two field works? The first one in Ivory Coast was based on the immigration data. You can see uh, in the first map that uh, the, the southwest region uh, is a cocoa region and coffee plantations. And it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, foreigners inside this uh, area, especially, especially coming from uh, Burkina Faso. And the second region, the second field work, was based on the first result about the, the survey. And we follow the financial flows to go to, to Burkina. And we identify two major hubs of uh, migratory and uh, financial practices, which are in uh, Kudugu, but also in uh, way we are in the north of the, of the country. The studied uh, populations, some characteristics. We speak about a uh, large family, transnational, with polygamist uh, practices. Uh, a lot of family are divided in, into the two countries, and uh, 
one spouses maybe can be in Ivory Coast and the other one in Burkina, and you have a lot of commutation between the, the two zones. And uh, it's an old migration pattern. We uh, interview some primo mi migrants, but also second and third generation. We, we still uh, have a strong uh, citizenship uh, related to, to Burkina. What about uh, economic activities? We talk about uh, cocoa and coffee plantations. 80% of the, of the sample uh, are uh, active in agriculture. And uh, it's not a big, uh, big farm, big plantation, but small uh, own plot and family, familial uh, exploitation. And uh, sometimes they try to diversify their product to uh, integrate uh, rubber tree or maybe palm nuts but uh, it's very uh, experimental. And uh, the financial practices are very, very reduced. Formal inclusion is very low, uh, uh, approximately 20%. And uh, there is also the problem of income uh, seasonality because of uh, cocoa plantation, maybe they receive the their revenue only two times uh, a year. And uh, transfer is a, is a mean of uh, securi sec securing uh, revenue. And it's very uh, important in this community. So the different data, tools, data collection tools that we use during uh, our study. First one, we go to the villages and speak with the chief. Ivorian chief, but also the migrant chief, and it's a uh, well-organized uh, uh, community with a pyramidal uh, structure. After we conduct some uh, focus group, both in Ivory Coast and in uh, Burkina Faso, with the relative of the migrant worker, And finally, the, the survey. Uh, we have um, 155 uh, family members uh, in Ivory Coast and 100 people uh, coming from uh, Burkina Faso inside their uh, home community. And the final uh, dimension is the spatial one. We uh, Opera geo geopositioning of uh, remittance provider, a census, both in, in the two countries. So with this um, analysis, we, we identify a typology of uh, remittance service provider in Ivory Coast. First one is a uh, well-known uh, major uh, international companies uh, which are the, the first uh, arrive in this uh, area, uh, such as uh, Western Union, Monogram, and uh, famous company. They rely on uh, internet technology, so they have a very reduced network, and not the closest approach to the local community. The second player is West African company, such as uh, Wari and Quick Cash. They rely on uh, GSM technology and they have a more decentralized uh, approach. And the newcomers are mobile money operators, which are uh, in the area since 2008, but the international uh, services uh, was launched in 2014. So what was the uh, spatial diffusion of the service? In 2012, you can see the map. It's a very reduced uh, network and the financial access is very limited to the main city of this uh, fieldwork. And after three, three years, 
we can see a complete different uh, situations. And a lot of uh, this uh, explanation is the mobile money diffusion, both in the major town, Meagi, but also in the smaller villages. You can see the different pictures, the uh, different type of uh, mobile money uh, agency. In uh, Meagi, there is uh, the big uh, big company, big uh, big shop, and after uh, each time you do you uh, go abroad, uh, Meagi, the smaller shop. In the villages, and finally inside the small uh, farmer camp. It's very reduced uh, infrastructure. What was uh, the impact of mobile money uh, diffusion inside the diaspora? We can see after uh, just one, one, uh, one year that uh, mobile money is very pervasive. Uh, almost half of the population have a mobile money account. And, uh, but uh, this rate of adoption is very uh, dis diversified uh, compared to the different localities that we, we study. What are the main reasons to open a, an account? It's mainly for, uh, to mitigate risk, to balance uh, income volatility, and to secure uh, travel, mobility pattern. And what about uh, international uh, remittance? Mobile money is, uh, is the first uh, services before, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, Western Union and the other company. Almost 30% uh, of the international remittance was made by mobile money services. The average uh, amount is reduced compared to the other services because we talk about uh, uh, urgent needs and also uh, the mobile money uh, allowed to make uh, closer and easier access to this uh, international uh, remittance services. As uh, this migrant uh, says, it uh, facilitated, facilitated the, the transfer and secured it also. The complex journey of the mobile money transfer from rural to rural uh, region First step is uh, the senders. We can see uh, that the, the chief of household is uh, the, the, they decide to, to make the transfer, but generally they, they don't, uh, they don't procedure themselves. They need to rely on a mobile money agent to do it. We don't talk about uh, direct transfer, but um, generally they, they need some intermediary to, to support the, the mobile money flows. And uh, a lot of transfer go to, to city and after transit to the rural, uh, rural zone. As in the final uh, recipient, Generally, the uh, family members, not uh, the household, but uh, sometimes parents and sometimes uh, the siblings. And the main uh, usage pattern is for consumption goods, but also uh, to pay school fees and medicines. Personal investment I is not very uh, popular, it's not very frequent.
In Burkina Faso, we see the same uh, diffusion of, uh, of the mobile money supply. The situation in 2012, and three years after, a big uh, diffusion. We discover that uh, this diffusion is mainly due to international transfer, because uh, the, the most uh, using uh, transaction is to cash out international transfer. Some strong barriers persist. Uh, if we study the supply side, we have some spatial disparities and some small villages uh, have a problem of access. And also cash out management inside the network is very difficult because the financial capacity of small agent is very uh, reduced. And also some uh, inter operability challenges between the, the two firms. And sometimes they interrupt the service due to a disagreement between the two firms. And from the demand side, we have also some problem with uh, gender. Women seems to be excluded uh, for mobile money diffusion. And also the elderly have some problem to master the, the technology. We have also some problem of trust and reluctance to innovations, uh, especially uh, with these populations. They sometimes uh, informal transfer persists and uh, the young, young people try to, to support the elderly to adopt this new technology, but it's not, uh, it's not very easy to do that. Finally, we discover that uh, informal brokers and uh, familial facilitators play a great role to contribute to the mobile money diffusion. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So now we have Andrew with Exploring Rosca Dynamics with a Cambodian factory working. Board game, worker board, board game. All right. All right. So first, uh, a really huge thank you to IMTM, uh, IMTFI. This uh, all came out as you'll. S I'll show a video in a second. This all came out of a workshop in 2014. It was just like brainstorming idea, but they were so supportive of become, making it become a project. I thought it might just become like, oh, that's a funny thing, and then it just you know goes off into the ether, but. They were very supportive in making it an actual project that could um, could find some use and have some applications. Uh, and yeah, so thanks very much to them for pushing me to, to make it become something rather than just uh, an idea. And also thanks to our players today during the lunchtime session. Uh, I hope they had fun. Was it fun? A bit? <laughs> but everyone was plotting and scheming to work out the dynamics of how to make the most money. So. It was, um, it was fun. Uh, so yeah, so we've already talked about what roscas are. I also, every time I Google rosca, I come up with this Mexican food. Is this like a thing? Like, is this? It's delicious. Okay, I've never heard of this in my life. For the day of the king. Okay. Baby, like a jelly baby or like a? Ah, oh, but what if you swallow it? <laughs> what if you swallow the baby? Oh, okay. It's a choking hazard. <laughs> ah. But the, there's always babies inside or just on the Three Kings holiday? Ah, oh, okay, so it's like a special. 
Uh, <laughs> all right, I'll have to try one. I, yeah, I never heard of it. Uh, but we sort of went, went through what Roskas are um, already. Um, so the difference between the ones in Cambodia, and I'm sure these exist in other countries too, but my background's Cambodia, so I don't know about uh, in other countries. But the standard Rosca is always just, uh, you know, the, the row part of it is this rotating where everyone contributes to a fund and then it rotates who gets to borrow, whereas the ones, the Tong Ting groups in Cambodia are more about this uh, bidding for who gets the, the pot. So it's this weird poker dynamic of uh, whoever bids the highest interest rate gets to take the, the money from the contributions. Um, so just to give you some background, so this is sort of the concept that I mentioned in the original workshop in 2014, uh, and then we sort of collaboratively, because uh, it was like a brainstorming session, built a game at it. So I'll show the video of that, because I think it's funny. So everyone's put in their, their money. Is everyone, are all the garment factory workers ready to go? So everyone gets a, gets a green card here. We might have to interpret one another. So these are all the needs. Right, so Everyone's so saying, everyone had to write their own different needs. Uh, I need to travel to a wedding on the other side of Cambodia. I need money for travel and for a gift and for a dress. Okay, my husband just lost his job and my daughter just told me she's pregnant. <laughs> uh, there is an opportunity I cannot miss. I plot uh, a land. Uh, if I do not buy it, know someone else would take it. Here he is. My husband put sale. Sale? Sold. Sold, no. Sold. Jail, 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 sorry, jail. Oh. oh, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> for not paying enough tax, and I need money to pay for a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the organizer, by the way. All these groups always have one factory worker that's sort of an old text role. Ah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's so interesting. This is all about husbands. I want the money <laughs> for my husband's uh, medical. Yeah, anyway, the, the, I just wanted to show the environment by, where this all uh, developed during the workshop. Um, but that was sort of come up on the spot. But over time, we sort of uh, developed it further and made the rules a bit stricter and um, brainstormed a lot. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was a process of after that, like, that was, you know, 18 months ago, whatever it is, and since then working with IMTFI and Jenny and Mina, we came up with a bunch of rules and played it a bunch of times and tried to, to develop. Oh, and one other point, like, yeah, why is this interesting? This is just a quick chart to show that, like, it's still really highly used in a lot of uh, countries, especially Cambodia. Like, when we did, we did the previous project we did about the comedy show, I don't know if you remember this from 2014, that was, we did a lot of surveys as part of that and we found about 70% of uh, the factory workers we surveyed used the Rosca, so it's still relevant. That's why it's good to have this, um, this interesting uh, board game about it. And as I say, it has this betting element, so that's why it makes it more of a game than a normal uh, Rosca. So in Cambodia, a lot of people participate in it to make a high return. They have enough cash, they know they're probably not, never going to need to borrow, but they actually just participate to make this high return because you, you can cash out. So if you participate with workers and they're always borrowing and adding all this extra interest, the pot grows and then eventually you just cash out of it and you've made all this interest. And some people can pay you know, effectively 60% interest rates on an annual basis. So it becomes this sort of investment tool rather than just cooperatively uh, sharing money. Um, yeah, so, but the, there is this trust element because as we saw in the game, people can run away with the money. So it usually is workers and close friends. Uh, so that's why factories are often uh, an area where Oscars happen because everyone knows each other, they know their base, they have their job there, they're not going to run away tomorrow. But uh, talking to workers as we did the surveys, we found it, it was more common than I thought for people to steal the money and just get another job. So, yeah, it, but there's this big trust element to it. Uh, so, 
yeah, so there's all these decisions. So the betting element adds a lot of different questions to it. Uh, that's just like a cartoon of me when we're trying to come up with how to do it. Um, it was just very confused. Uh, but there's all these questions in this system of like, should you borrow at all? Your bidding level, so you can get into these bidding competitions. Once you have the, the money, should you use it to buy assets? So in the game, you have all these options to buy different assets, like your um, chickens or your uh, dumpling stand and all this, and so whether you should buy these assets. How to balance that with needs you might have to pay. So if you spend too much uh, on assets, you might not have money for needs. And helping other members. So in the game, you're allowed to help people. Uh, and this happens in real life, too, where people don't want people to go bankrupt, so they help aside from the game. And yeah, whether to steal the money, run away, and whether to just get out of the, the Tong Tin group. So all these factors mean there's like all these different dynamics involved. So you can break it up and you can go, there's like a borrowing element, as we talked about, like often can be used as like an emergency fund base. So you only take the money when you need it, but it can also be uh, just used as this high rate of return. So people just put money into it because as an investment, like an uh, informal investment tool. And also you've got the asset purchasing uh, reason so to borrow from it when you need to buy assets that can later generate income and also this this trust and loyalty development so there's a lot of these we've only built the game but we're kind of thinking about using the game to explore these dynamics within developing countries and because you can use the rates to sort of link that to the level of trust people have between each other because the higher interest rates usually suggest people don't trust the group as much and then yeah, so why, why have this board game at all? What's the purpose? So I don't know if any, everyone remembers the really old Simpsons episode with Mr. Bergstrom. Does anyone remember this? <laughs> no? Okay. So he's like the substitute teacher that makes learning fun. And like Lisa falls in love with him and everything because it's like so much more interesting than um, the uh, Mr. Krabappel. So yeah, so that's the sort of aim. That's one of the aim of it is just to teach people both in developing countries and outside of developing countries about how ROSCAs work. Because sometimes, you know, I, when I was learning about it in Cambodia, I, I didn't get how it worked. So playing a game is a really good way to understand the system. And also, as I just said, allowing researchers to explore these dynamics. And if you, it's, it's in the Cambodia, I don't know if it's the same in other countries, but if you start asking questions about people's participation in ROSCAs, they get a bit touchy. Like, they don't want to talk about where their money is, what ROSCAs they're involved with, how much they bid. But if you do it in sort of a game format, people, like, they kind of, it's fun, so they, they do it as they um, maybe would in real life. So you can actually collect data um, in this fun game environment rather than trying to squeeze information from them. Uh, and also, yeah, if you're new to ROSCAs, it gives you a way to practice the dynamics and maybe educate people in schools about what they are and the risks and benefits of using them. Uh, so yeah, so we did, we developed this game over time uh, and then with IMTFI and then eventually we decided to do some, so we got the grant to do the project and part of that is doing this game testing. So we came up with this prototype but it's like, okay, there's this prototype, but is it actually reflective of life in Cambodia? So we went to Cambodia to factories, uh, garment factories, and we ran these sessions where we had 30 minutes of play and focus groups where everyone just talked about the game and whether they thought it was reflective of their lives. And then also we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one tablet surveys and collected a lot of data. So that was only like three weeks ago, so I haven't got like finalized data analysis of it, but we do have voice recordings and all the tablet survey data. So later we'll do like an actual study of that. Um, so I can show you a quick clip of what it was like when everyone was playing it in Cambodia. There's no subtitles, but you, you'll get the... Hãy 
Bạn mới năng một Phật Sang ơi mà ơi, nè kìa People didn't like taking him from the top for some reason. Yeah, so that's just a taste of what it was like. And um, yeah, so overall, everyone found it, because it's using just pictures and everything, everyone found it quite simple to get the concepts. And then we found like it was usually quite, uh, quite fun for everyone. Um, but we also found there were bits that we didn't quite get uh, when we designed it. So. Uh, this, this chief player, we, didn't, we never knew about this insurance concept that the chief... So the chief player is very critical because they manage all the money and make sure it adds up, like Ursula was doing very generously, um, which is not easy. But they, they also provide insurance. So if anyone does run away with the money, the chief actually has to pay back whatever the pot is at that point. And the reason the chief does this is because... And this, is, this happens sometimes when people don't want to borrow the pot, then the chief just keeps the money so they can use it for their other purposes. So it's sort of that trade-off between providing insurance but keeping hold of the money. Um, also assets and expenses, like I underestimated the cost of a pig and things like this, so we updated um, things like that. And I might change the white guy stole your money card as well. But, um, uh, <laughs> but the other thing we took away is that because finishing the game, as I said in the first part, is an issue. It's like, when do you win? And we always, uh, uh, like talking, when we were designing it, it was always like, oh, we don't want to make it like poker where you have to make everyone bankrupt. It has to be a group kind of thing. But when we played it like that, everyone was bored. Like, people really wanted something of they can win the game. Uh, so it's still like an open question how we finish it. And we just got some good feedback then playing the game where there should be a card like, okay, that's the end of the game, and then everyone just adds up. Uh, how much money they have and who has the most money wins, but it's hard to get that cooperative. And I think there's got like anthropological elements to it of people like to win the indiv these individual games. Uh, so future applications, so we're already, uh, the factory put us in contact with Winrock International who are, are funded by USAID and they do a lot of uh, work in terms of anti-human trafficking in Cambodia. So there's a lot of human trafficking issues between Thailand and uh, Cambodia where Cambodians go to Thailand for sex work and other um, jobs because they can earn a higher income and send it back to their families. And Winrock International, they try to stop people from uh, doing that. So they wanted to use the game as an educational tool uh, for Cambodians near the border so they understand how to grow their assets instead of having to go to Thailand uh, to make money instead. So it already seems to be some interest from NGOs. So we hope it goes viral, but I don't know if that'll happen. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. We think there's potential for these behavioral studies. Uh, just, yeah, things like people playing with different goals if they play individually just for their own money versus and like insurance elements and things like this. There's, we haven't fleshed out the details, but there's probably potential there in behavioral economics and anthropology. And then, yeah, using it in schools, both in develop, developing countries, but also developed worlds, so people can get a taste of what it's like managing their money if they live in a developing country. I mean, it might just be good for students to get 
a picture of that. And yeah, and eventually, because we started out trying to make this as an, an app, and we were going to have like an app competition at UCI, and it became a bit too difficult to organize, but I think if we could make this some kind of app, eventually it would, yeah, people could play it on phones and tablets and might make it um, even more fun. And then uh, when, we, when we get the app and all the thing goes viral and it gets very popular, we're going to sell it to Hasbro for $120 million. <laughs> um, so if you want to invest money now, just come talk to me afterwards. Um, there's a lawyer with me that can arrange the, the paperwork. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so thanks very much to everyone again for playing the game and, uh, yeah, thanks for MTF5 for all this support to, to get it happening. So, thanks. Thank you so much to all our panelists for such superb um, presentations. So with that, uh, I would like to open the floor. I have some questions, but first of all, I would like to open the, the floor and compliment uh, some of the questions uh, that you may ask. Perfect, it's Hi. nice to see that people are still willing to continue learning before the photo group. Well done, guys. <laughs> Hi. Oh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. So I just have a few questions. One is to, um, let me see, I forgot who it was, but it was about cross-border transfers. Yeah, so the second group. Um, you mentioned that some of the money was transferred from not rural to rural directly, but had to transit through cities. So can you elaborate what that means? How I imagine it to be is that you transfer it digitally through mobile money to the cities and then someone p cashes it out in the city and then carries it in cash to rural areas. So if you can elaborate on, on that, that would be great. Um, if there's some diversity there and what are the, the, the risks involved, um, why they do that. And uh, the other question is about the rules of the game for Andrew. So in your five sessions, how have you uh, changed the goal of the game, because when you introduced it before lunch, you said that sometimes you do it this way or the other. So in what ways have you varied it? And, it, and besides the fun aspect, what are the di different things you, you've observed when you try to make it a collaborative, let's grow, let's get as much money out of this pot by the end as possible for the group? That would be interesting to know. Thank you. I have another s similar question to Andrew. Uh, here, I want to know what's the, is there a maximum limit to bidding? And uh, I, you know, in my life, I, my mother does this, and she's been doing this, uh, this Roska's thing. But in Pakistan, I've never seen bidding happening on these Roska's. In fact, it seems like it, the bidding actually kills the purpose, the spirit of Roska's, because it is more like a need-based you know, sharing of resources, but at the same time, it's also a redistribution of risk over on the entire group. But with bidding, it seems like it's become, what if, like, there are two people, you know, who needs the same money at the same time, so now who's going to get it? So the person who's bidding more, of course, seems like, but what about the need, you know? If my mother is in the hospital and I have to pay medical bills. So if you can, like, talk about that. I think there are variations in Roscas across the entire world, basically. And there are case examples you can read. And the other question is basically is open to the entire panel, is uh, exactly on this question of financial inclusion. You know, we've been discussing this yesterday and today, and the, one of the things that is uh, occurring in my mind is we want to include these people in the financial structure and financial services. So I think the other way of looking at it is to ask the question, which is the main question here, is the radical redistribution of wealth. You know, It's actually the 1% of the pop people who are holding the entire wealth of the 99% of the population. So if we redistribute the wealth of that 1%, the 99% will automatically, automatically will get included 
in the finance. <laughs> you know? That's, that's it. If you can, guys can comment on that, you know, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So we can come. Also, mostly to Andrew, just to add on to the question asked over there, what was lost in translation as you go from culture to culture? I'm just curious, as you did the game, and then how much of the uh, 120 million would go to IMTFI? <laughs> and be honest. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Who wants to take first? One more? Okay, perfect. Thank you for the interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I, the, the first comment is already addressed, which is about the loss, being lost in translation. Uh, and I was wondering, especially Andrew, what, are the, what is the value of having to standardize uh, all of these rotating loan schemes into this thing called ROSCA? Because I'm very uncomfortable with that concept, uh, ROSCA, because it, it loses out. It actually excludes many other practices and tends to frame people into uh, one particular form. And uh, I, I wanted to ask everybody in the panel, um, which also relates to some of what we've heard today, what is, how do we factor in history? What's the place of history um, in this? Because in the Ivory Coast, uh, case, you know, it's very embedded in a history of movement and mobility within this context. Uh, so how do we factor this in and also calculate it as something that is uh, measurable? Um, because we're talking about the present, we're trying to predict the future. I think it's just one project today in the morning. I think it was Andrea and Elisa who talk, spoke about the past, the present, and the future. Uh, so how do we factor in history in all these projects in a way that makes us understand it uh, better? And uh, my last comment is about uh, trust. Uh, I know that the IMTFI has produced something about trust, but still it's very difficult to convert it into something that we can actually measure. Uh, because there's trust which is material and there's trust which is non-material. So how, how do we measure it you know, in, in these projects? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So who wants to take the first try? Yeah. Um, thanks for all your uh, questions and, um, and comments. Uh, the, the, the fact that the trans, some transfer will transit uh, through the cities, uh, we've, well, what, what we, we've seen is that uh, most, uh, an important part of the transfer is not a person to person is uh, transiting in, in uh, indirect transfer. Um, and uh, this uh, gives rise to new, um, the emergence of new intermediaries. And we've been uh, doing some focus group with students. So stu uh, young people born in Ivory Coast, but who are, have been sent by the family uh, to Ouagadougou to uh, follow some, some studies there. So they are studying in Burkina Faso, and they, re they really make the link between uh, Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso. And uh, um, many, many transfer would go from Ivory Coast, then Ouagadougou on their mobile money account, and then uh, they would cash out and then they would bring uh, the money to the village. So this is also a way to maintain uh, ties and uh, ties between uh, the family in Ivory Coast uh, and to, uh, with, uh, with the family in Ouagadougou in uh, Burkina Faso through this uh, new uh, uh, figure of uh, yeah, intermediaries or uh, these young, young students. Um, and also the, the, the role of the city is also some migrants hide their investment in uh, Burkina Faso. So they send money not to their village, but they, they would send money to uh, other cities to invest in so that it's not visible uh, uh, to the, um, their family members in the village. Um, so maybe I can leave the floor to my colleagues. Okay. And this, there was a qu question to all of us: uh, financial inclusion, wealth uh, red red uh, redistribution of wealth. Uh, I start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
so it, it, was, it, it was the sense of the question I was asking you yesterday, that if you are looking at wealth creation along the, you know, the uh, financial inclusion chain at each level of, uh, of a specific actor that you were also aiming in your study at looking at uh, each uh, actor and uh, the wealth creation at, this, uh, at each level. I really think that you, you're right. It's, it's a very important question you are asking and that financialization and here uh, mobile money uh, is one of the f drivers of financialization of uh, local uh, economies is also a new form of uh, exploitation or I don't know how to call it, but yeah, we are making money uh, from them. Uh, I would be very interested in, you know, uh, getting, and I think we, we can do it uh, within this project, getting a very, very de detailed, precise uh, information on what is extracted on each transaction and then um, goes to the top. And I think that uh, this doesn't go uh, in the sense of a better uh, redistribution of wealth and it's uh, uh, co the contrary, I'm pretty sure. Uh, convinced uh, uh, about this, or maybe Ben Kata or Andrew. What's up, Quelqu'un va me traduire. Moi, je voulais ajouter, mais en français, si vous permettez. Modérateur, ça va, hein? je peux. Vous allez le prendre. Euh, au fait, euh, pour ceux qui connaissent l'Afrique de l'Ouest savent que cette migration en question, effectivement, elle est très ancienne. La migration euh, des Burkinabés en Côte d'Ivoire, euh, elle, elle date au moins de 100 ans, c'est-à-dire le temps de la colonisation. Et comme c'est une vieille, euh, enfin, relativement, migration, euh, il a fallu justement la crise, ces dernières, des, ces dernières années-là, la crise, ce qu'on appelle pudiquement en Côte d'Ivoire, la crise post-électorale de 2010. 2011. Il a fallu la crise pour qu'il y ait des retours massifs. Donc, euh, tous ceux qui sont partis en migration en Côte d'Ivoire, les Burkinabés qui sont partis en migration en Côte d'Ivoire, quand ils reviennent, ils s'installent dans les zones euh, agricoles, les meilleures zones agricoles qui sont autour de Bobo, dit Lasso. Et donc, ils s'installent en attendant de rentrer leurs enfants qui vont à l'école ou leurs euh, ou leurs cours, ou les parcelles qu'ils ont eu à construire à Bobo ou à Ouagadougou, dans les grands centres. Et à ce que je voulais ajouter à ce que Mme Solène a eu à dire, ça c'est d'une part. Effectivement, l'histoire influe beaucoup sur cette migration-là. Et c'est cette histoire-là qui explique bien, en fait, les comportements, les pratiques aujourd'hui, par rapport à justement cette innovation, qui est une bonne chose, qui leur permet, parce qu'avant, c'est des migrants qui ne revenaient pas, qui restaient longtemps, qui... Enfin, qui Pensez vivre là-bas, comme au Ghana, enfin, il y a eu, on a eu des migrants au Ghana qui sont laissés, et en Côte d'Ivoire, euh, ils pensaient qu'ils étaient bien intégrés, mais il y a eu la crise, et, enfin, les retours massifs, et aujourd'hui, effectivement, ils, euh, ils reviennent, mais ils préfèrent quand même rester en ville. Quoi. Merci. Yeah, so the first question to me about the rule changes, yeah, so the, I think the biggest uh, difference we noticed is this lower level of risk taking and lower level of borrowing. So when you had a goal that it was all about the group pool of money, it was all collaborative, people, yeah, for some reason people didn't really borrow that much from the pot, they just sort of let luck see what happens and the pot would gradually grow and people would like like give money to people that might go bankrupt because of needs, there was a bit more sharing there. Whereas when it was about winning, people would take big risks, like they would bet really high interest rates to borrow the money and then they'd buy assets and they, yeah, you would get this split in income, in a co which links to your question. And I think, I mean, I, th I think it's good at reflecting just the concept of interest and um, banks versus cooperative institutions as a whole. It's just as soon as interest comes in and people pay higher interest rates for higher risk, then you have more winners, more losers, and you do have that income inequality. So I think that kind of reflects finance generally and maybe shows that even if it's an informal setting, as soon as interest is being paid for risk, it, it people do get richer. So the pot would get a lot bigger when... Um, 
you had the the individuals fighting for themselves, but a lot more people would go bankrupt at the same time. So I think that kind of reflected the income inequality that's, I think, inherent in sort of a banking system or financial system like that where interest is involved. Uh, and uh, yeah, lost lost in translation. Um, yeah, I th uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, apart from the just the the concept of uh, winning, I think it was yeah. Th there was like a, a element of looking out for certain players in the game. I think whereas I think today when we played at lunch, everyone was a bit in it for themselves. Whereas even though all the workers kind of knew each other, there was kind of teaming up and things like this, um, which we didn't have. I don't know if just because people playing today weren't best friends like when we played at a factory in Cambodia, but um, I guess you could say that's a maybe p possible difference. And uh, yeah, the standardization um, thing. I think, I think in Cambodia it became standardized, like, like I don't know if this is just my theories, but it sounds like it was like a lack of investment opportunities. So after, uh, and it's a very old concept, the Tong Ting thing, but it, like it wasn't since Vietnam or anything, but I think lack of, lack of ease of financial access to make money on, um, to have investment opportunities, I think Tong Ting became this default. We want to make, we've got a pool of secure money, so we throw a lot of it into a Tong Ting because we can get really high returns from it every month because some people are really in need and pay high interest rates. So I think that, I don't know, that's kind of just my theory, but I don't know if that's true about why it sort of became a standardized method in. There are some that do more cooperative in Cambodia as well, but definitely the Tong Ting bidding thing is, um, I think is kind of the, the standard. Um, yeah, and financial, what do we have? The financial inclusion generally, um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is something I struggle with, like, with the 99%, 1% thing. Because, I mean, I know uh, Noam Chomsky has his fund where you just, you can send money directly to people's phones um, through m or whatever mobile money, and it's like, that's it. You just, like, send $100, bang, and it's not like an NGO program. It's not via World Bank or anything. It's just you're giving people money directly, redistributing wealth. But I, I think, like, it's an interesting idea, but I think... In terms of like stability, I think stability is a big thing that needs to be talked about as well. Like when you're increasing GDP levels quite high or increasing people's incomes levels quite high, that does have this income inequality but also impact on stability and that affects people's social structures. And so I think it's not always better for people to get rich fat like quickly. I think it needs to be this stable process and I think just immediately redistributing huge amounts of money would have like huge global consequences for politics and um, social stability and things like that. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. Yeah, just a few words. Um, so no, what, uh, just to end with Norman's uh, comments, I think what he's uh, asking us and what he's reminding us is that we have to, we really need to make a, a critical um, analysis of this system, uh, whole system, and, and to make a political analysis uh, of, the, of the whole uh, financial system. So thanks a lot for reminding it. Um, even looking at the very local um, financial practices. Uh, so history and trust, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, I would I, I would be very very humble. Uh, in line with what uh, Jodoné was uh, saying, that uh, 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 political history and uh, yeah, it's it's a very important background in uh, the the ties uh, that are being built by migrants with uh, Burkina Faso and the, the family members in Burkina Faso. We we made a, a lot of interviews with. Uh, 
uh, well, uh, large um, a range of, of people, informal discussion, and uh, this uh, political issue uh, and the political context in Ivory Coast is always uh, something uh, that comes out very strongly, um, and that m migrants uh, feel very, you know, uncomfortable. Um, well, uh, both in Ivory Coast, where they are not, I mean, uh, their uh, um, presence is uh, s very often challenged, and. Uh, uh, and but as well in Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, uh, they don't feel at home. So it's uh, it's a very complicated uh, aspect, and and uh, remittances are also a way to uh, maintain ties and to strengthen ties ties with their home uh, country. But not only they all, there are also a lot of uh, uh, exchange of they they, they would uh, uh, within the family uh, the extended family they would uh, also welcome. Uh, um, um, children from the family in, Bur in Burkina Faso to Ivory Coast. So this is also a way to uh, maintain uh, ties with their uh, country in case something happened in Ivory Coast. So this is very important, but we've been very, we, we have to be very humble. We, we just take it as a, a contextual um, aspect, as contextual. context. But it's uh, shaping, uh, of course, uh, people, uh, strategies and practices. Uh, and trust, material trust and immaterial trust. Uh, yeah, th uh, th th there is an issue with uh, the technology, but there is also an issue, uh, and we've been looking at it, uh, the who is uh, providing the service in the locality and you know the, the local politics of uh, the provision of such uh, services. So we still need to deepen this, this part of the analysis, but you're right, it's uh, uh, not only the material trust uh, embedded in these uh, new devices, but also uh, the ma immaterial um, aspect, dimension of, of trust. Thanks a lot for your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, so Len Benkat, could you like to um, touch up on the, okay, perfect. So any other questions? That we have from the panel? Okay, no so time. just wanted to thank you so much for uh -huh. all these presentations and to the audience for the attention. <laughs>